Hello, this is Steven Nojiri, and this is another video. And this video is going to be about what is the Southern Court? Who are the Southern Court loyalists? How do these connect to the Tata Genji? And how do they connect to Shinobi and Ninjitsu, Shinobi no Jitsu? So these are the points we're going to look at. Now, let's begin with the basics. So this video may end up being long, but I'm going to try to make it as streamlined as possible. The basics of the Southern Court. In the 1300s, Emperor Go-Daigo fought against the Hojo Shoguns for control of Japan. Essentially, the, Ho the Hojo Shogunate had ripped control of the country away from the Emperor. The Emperors had essentially become puppets. And this was completely against Shinto completely against the very foundations of samurai and quite frankly go Emperor Godaigo was not going to have any of it so he was going to restore the imperial line to correct to authentic authority as I said the Hojo shoguns had decided they would control the emperors uh, it went against Shinto and the very foundation of samurai etc etc so um, the Emperor Godaigo with many loyal samurai such as Kusunoki Masashige succeeded in the Kemu restoration, and, uh, which did away with the Hojo Shogunate and made the emperor the uncontested leader of Japan. So not only did the Kemu restoration restore the emperor to power, but it also came with some changes of, uh, some legal changes, changes in certain political things, etc., etc. Basically, um, when the emperor took control from the Hojo, he's also going to change some things because now that the emperor's in charge again, you know, some things have to change. But there was one of his generals, Ashikaga Takuiji, who ended up turning on the emperor. See, so there's a picture of Emperor Godaigo. You can see him. He's got all of his, his uh, imperial um, headpiece on, but he's also got all the Buddhist garb on. You see him using the Vajra and Bell, etc., etc. So Emperor Godaigo was a very esoteric Buddhist practitioner. Um, but there's there's a picture of him. Uh, Emperor Godaigo had returned control back to the imperial line, but Ashikaga Takuiji wanted to be shogun. Emperor Godaigo did not agree to make him shogun. He said, no, Ashikaga, you're not going to be the shogun. And Ashikaga did not like that, so Ashikaga raised a rebellion. He created an army uh, to go against the emperor. Now, initially... Initially, this was not going well for Ashikaga. There's a lot more steps to it. Ashikaga ends up getting sort of pushed to the western provinces, and then he builds more of a force and wins some battles over there and comes back. But uh, that's a lot of detail. But what we're going to essentially point, uh, focus on is that he is clever. He knew that he could not just attack the emperor without it being a political fiasco, being a Shinto sin, if you will. Now, of course, I'm using the word sin as a western w term, but we're going to use it in this video to sort of emphasize how wrong something is within the context of the world at the time. So just attacking the emperor would be a fiasco, a sin, right? It was, what are you doing? You're a samurai. You don't, what are you doing attacking the emperor, right? So, and, and remember, he had just helped Emperor Godaigo regain the country, right? So, but he had a solution to this. Ashikaga's solution was he was going to find another emperor and a, another person who could be emperor and appoint them emperor. Uh, and this is where it can be very complicated, like I said. So let's take our time to go through the issue here and, and only focus on the key points. Now, through this video, you're going to hear me say, despite modern misconceptions or despite what some historians may say, and the, and the reason for this is very complicated, basically another video. In a nutshell, um, there are people who either have bad data or they have chosen to ignore data and they publish ideas which are not based on the data that's actually available, but we won't go into that too much. So anyway, like I said, despite the modern day misconceptions, Imperial Line does not have to come through the first sun. In fact, many of the most beloved and famous emperors of Japanese history were not the first son. Emperor Jimu, a paragon of imperial military might, I mean, you know, the shining example of 
you know, the, of this warrior emperor creating the empire. He was actually the fourth son of his father. So you have to get rid of this idea that it has to be the first emperor. This is a modern misconception. The, the, they only have to be part of the imperial family. They do not have to be the first son of the emperor. That's just not true. Like I said, many times through history, there have been multiple brothers who could take the throne, and for whatever reason, one is picked and the others simply become backup in case the emperor dies. So the younger brother might become emperor, and the older brother just is a prince until unless his younger brother dies or abdicates or something like that. So Emperor Godaigo is part of an imperial line called the Daikakuji line, and there was another line of imperial succession, the Jimyoin line. And this, this, these people, these, these imperial family members could be placed on the throne. So Ashikaga gave his loyalty to the Jimyoin and declared that line, the Jimyoin line, as the true emperors. But this was a problem. Simply put, the problem is that Emperor Godaigo was still alive and Emperor Godaigo had not abdicated. So uh, there's really no way that Ashikaga's plan is legitimate. That's a huge issue. Now, also, side note here, important note, the Hojo Shoguns had actually tried this exact same trick during the Kemu Restoration. They were trying to use one of these other potential emperors, and the Hojo Shoguns had, or the Hojo Shogunate had done this exact same. They had said, well, oh, this person can be emperor, he, you know, from a legitimate line, so we've decided they're the emperor. Don't listen to Godaigo. But again, Godaigo is the emperor. He's alive. He's not abdicated. Only he gets to say who's emperor, right? So, and the irony is, Ashikaga Takuiji had fought against the Hojo and dismissed this plan of theirs as ridiculous. Oddly enough, when he wanted power, he decided to use the same plan they did. Kind of weird, right? Emperor Godaigo obviously refused to acknowledge Ashikaga's claim to being Shogun and the absurd claim that the Jimyoin Emperor was now Emperor simply because Ashikaga had declared it. So that Ashikaga's plan was say the Jimyoin line is the is now Emperor and then they name him Shogun. Now he's Shogun based on their decree. The only problem is they can't actually be Emperor because Godaigo is still alive and hasn't abdicated. This problem gets worse when Ashikaga takes advantage of a tactical blunder made by Emperor Godaigo's forces and ends up taking Kyoto. Now this is the battle that cost the life of Kusunoki Masashige, the founder of the Kusunoki tradition. So this is where a lot of the Tata Genji and Kusunoki stuff ties in with Kusunoki and his family and his retainers. Also, the Tata Genji families are serving Emperor Godaigo. So this is where that ties in. But Masashige dies at this battle. Now, Masashige had warned the generals of this, of impending failure of this, of, of their defense of this area, but the generals did not pay heed to Masashige and Emperor Godaigo's forces took a big hit at this loss. And now Ashikaga was able to establish a pretender emperor in Kyoto. Now let's take just a moment to acknowledge the start of the Kusunoki tradition. So as I said, Kusunoki Masashige was a student of Chinese war classics and the Genji, the Tata Genji, and the Oe Genji traditions. He combined the Genji tactics and the Chinese teachings into a very unique form of guerrilla warfare. 500 troops or less, a lot of hit and run, a lot of spies, a lot of espionage, things like that. Uh, when he felt he was going to die against Ashikaga's advance, he met with his retainers and his sons at a place called Sakurai. So it's a, kind of like a, we'll just say, we won't go in. It's just a place called Sakurai. And gave a very long speech with a lot of military and political and spiritual and philosophical teachings. And these were written down and given to his sons. His retainers also learned a lot of this material because they were literally sitting in listening to his speech. 
and even though they didn't get a formal transmission of these traditions such as the documents they weren't the you know they weren't the actual person who was being he was handing this down to his sons but since they were there they learned they learned it as well so this was actually the beginning of the Kusunoki tradition and all and because there were so many of his retainers there now many of these retainers end up dying but not all of them so there are many people who were there at the Sakurai teaching at the at this location at this time who heard his teachings and uh, essentially from this moment is what spawns not only the main Kusunoki tradition but this is also where many of the other Kusunoki Ryu schools that pop up through samurai history almost everything comes back to this to this uh, moment to this event well, once Ashikaga gained this momentum, the war between Emperor Godaigo and Ashikaga's puppet emperor was in full swing. This period is known as the Nanboku Jidai, or the period of the southern and northern courts. And it's, excuse me, it's called that because the southern court, that's Emperor Godaigo's court, is now based in Yoshino. So the northern court, which is Ashikaga's puppet government, the pretender, they're based out of Kyoto. Now, Kyoto is north of Yoshino. Yoshino is south. So you'll see on this map, the red is around Kyoto. That's the northern court, Kyoto. And you can't see the words Yoshino on this map, but where it says Nara, N-A-R-A, -A, Yoshino is right in that area. So basically where the N and the A are, kind of to the south of where the N is in that area. So that's the southern court. And this video is not going to cover the entire Nanboku Jidai. We're just going to point out some events that took place in the war. Kitabatake wrote the Jino Shotoki. This, the Jino Shotoki is an incredibly important, not only a southern court document, but, it's, but it has now become a standard Shinto holy text. But it is within the Jino Shotoki you can find much of the southern court ideology. This is also a time when the first drafts of the Taiheiki were written. The Taiheiki is really more of a genre, not a single text, but this is where it starts. The Taiheiki's sort of first drafts begin to come together during this time period. The Ashikaga are initially beaten. However, they do take up arms again. So initially, the southern court beats the northern court, but then the northern court sort of rears its head again. Ashikaga's own brother defects to the southern court, but he does eventually rejoin his brother. However, even though he rejoins his brother, many of the generals that also defected stick with the southern court. For example, Momonoe Naotsune stays with the southern court and becomes one of the major and successful southern court generals from that point onward. Now, even though Ashikaga's brother rejoins him, Ashikaga poisons his brother. So uh, that's what he gets for rejoining his brother, unfortunately. Kusunoki's oldest son is killed. So his, so his younger brother, not Kusunoki's younger brother, the oldest son's younger brother. In other words, Kusunoki's younger son, who's named Kusunoki Masanori, takes over. So the oldest son dies, the younger son takes over. And actually, it's Kusunoki Masanori is the one who most of Kusunoki Ryu is based on. Most people think that it's, you know, Kusunoki Masashige. Now, Masashige laid down the initial teachings, but it's Masanori who really puts those teachings through the usage, like battle testing them, through uh, the, the war. Masanori actually used these teachings to conduct a plot. He, when things were going really bad for the South later on, so initially the south beats the north, the north sort of gives up, but then it rears its head again, it sort of rebels again. And later, um, things start going kind of bad for the, for the south. And in the late 1360s, so in 1369, things start to go bad for the south. So Masanori actually decides to join the north. Now, he doesn't do this because he's disloyal to the South. He does this because when he joins the North, he's able to create a peace treaty with a general named Hosokawa, and that actually stops the war. And, and this actually holds for a couple of years, and it gives time for the Southern forces to recuperate. But 
when this when basically the the strategic advantage begins to fall apart Masanori then returns to the south and he takes up arms again as one of the main southern generals so this sort of joining the north and then returning to the south was basically a massive strategy to buy time for the south in the end the south and the north end up reaching a truce they actually make a peace treaty between the two emperors the 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 southern emperor and the northern emperor make a peace treaty now this truce is despite modern misunderstandings is not the end of the story many people will tell you many Japanese historians will tell you and almost all English material will tell you that this was the end of the war and that is absolutely not true